This is chapter five, the working cell. Um, definitely have your outline with you as you go through this lecture. The cartoon that you see is of an enzyme that's trying to order uh, some coffee. This enzyme is pretty picky because uh, enzymes are inside cells and they are proteins that need a very special environment in order to work. Maybe after the lecture that you'll understand the, the cartoon a little bit better. <clears throat> but make sure that you have your outline as we go through. So the reason why we talk about energy in the first topic of this outline is because one of the characteristics of life is that all living things are able to use energy. And by using the different kinds of energy in the world, we need to talk about, well, what are the different kinds of energy and how can cells use that? <clears throat> so let's take a look at the types of energy. So energy is defined for you in the first part of the outline. So it's the capacity to do work, um, to cause some kind of change or rearrange a collection of matter. So if you think about chemical reactions, you're rearranging atoms and that's basically um, the work, right, that you need to do. So when you create a chemical bond or when you break one, that's rearranging a collection of matter. And so you're going to need energy for that. And there's two kinds of energy. There is um, kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. If you look at your outline, and if you look also down here in this picture, we have different kinds of kinetic energy. So anything that's moving has kinetic energy. So if you're running down the street, you have kinetic energy because you're, you're running, you're moving. So if you see the word movement down here in this picture, anything moving has energy or uh, uh, the kinetic energy, right? So it's the energy that's in motion. So moving objects or light or sound waves or electricity, those are all kinds of motion. Um, heat, let me just mention heat here. Heat is the most disordered form of energy. So um, in the outline, I say that heat is the energy in the random movements of molecules. The more molecules move around, the more energy these molecules have, right? So when you have a warm, um, it's a warm day, the molecules, um, in the atmosphere are just moving a lot faster than a cold day where the molecules are moving slower. Heat is measured in taking a temperature, right? So if something has a high temperature, the more heat they have. And so the more molecules are moving and the more energy is present. So yeah, so in short, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. The opposite is potential energy. So potential energy is the energy an object has due to its location or its structure. It's the energy of position. So if you look here at the different kinds of potential energy, um, there's mechanical energy, stored mechanical energy, nuclear energy, chemical energy, and gravitational energy. Let's take a look at a picture so we can understand the two kinds of energy a little bit more. So you see that this person here is climbing up to um, a diving board. And at the bottom in the pool here, these people have their least potential energy. So they don't have a lot of, they, they may have kinetic energy as they swim, but they don't have a lot of potential energy because potential energy, this is the energy of position. But as this person climbs up the ladder and up another ladder, they're moving against gravity, right? So climbing converts this kinetic energy. So the energy that they have in the climb to a potential energy. So this person has the greatest potential here because of their position, right? So if they were to jump, that potential energy in their position gets converted to kinetic energy as they dive. So the diving, right, converts the potential energy to kinetic energy. And then here they have the lowest or the least amount of potential energy. So in, use, in this cycle here, you're seeing that energy change forms. You have this kinetic energy um, in the motion of someone diving, and then you have the potential energy being gained as you move higher and higher up into this um, position against gravity. So the kind of potential energy that a lot of um, living things use is chemical energy. So if you look at your outline under letter B, the energy in chemical bonds is a form of stored potential energy. So when you eat food, right, if you're having an apple, um, the energy that's in that apple is in the sugars and it's in the fiber and the different kinds of organic molecules that your, your body gets the calories out of, right? So in that sh sugar group, where is the energy in that sugar? It's in the chemical bonds. So all chemicals that um, 
out there will have a form of potential energy in their bonds. We use the potential energy in plants and animals, right, that the, the molecules there when we eat, and we break those molecules down and we extract the energy from those chemical bonds. And we'll look at it, it precisely how that's done in chapter six. Um, nuclear energy is the energy that's in um, the nucleus of an atom, right? And then in your outline, elevated objects, so that an elevated object like this person has a lot of potential energy. So this brings us to the law of the conservation of energy. So energy of the universe, so all the energy that we know in the entire universe cannot be created nor destroyed. So you can't just invent energy out of nothing. The energy is this, you know, it's, it's a finite um, amount of energy, but energy can change forms. So that's what living things do. Living things can take the potential energy and convert it to kinetic energy. And some living things can take kinetic energy and convert it to a potential energy. So let's take a look at some examples here. So these are bioluminescent jellyfish, right? So jellyfish are animals and they eat. So they eat smaller creatures. So that when they eat, right, what kind of energy is the food that they eat? Is it kinetic energy or is it potential energy? And if you remember what I just said, it's potential energy. So all chemicals out there have a potential um, energy in their chemical bonds. So what are these jellyfish doing? They're converting that potential energy into light and also in motion, right? So we know that moving, just moving from here to there, that's kinetic energy, but what's light? <clears throat> so it turns out that light, if you look in your outline, it is a form of kinetic energy because light photons move at the speed of light and that's a form of kinetic energy. So in this picture here, we have jellyfish will take the potential energy in the food they eat and convert it to motion kinetic energy and light kinetic energy. Let's think about the, a person running, right? So how do we get um, the energy to run? Again, from food. So it's potential energy. We take the potential energy from food and we convert it to kinetic energy, right? The ability to run. How about plants? All right, so plants are special because they can photosynthesize and they can use the energy of the sun to make sugar. So energy of the sun, right, light is a form of kinetic energy and they can use that kinetic energy to convert it to sugars and to growing, um, you know, more leaves made of cellulose and different molecules. So they can actually take the kinetic energy from the sun, convert it to potential energy um, in growing and also in the sugars. Now let's look at this last example here. So we have a matchstick, we have wood, okay? And so this wood is full of potential energy, the chemical bonds of the wood. When you strike the match, the match gives off both heat and light, right? So what is heat and light? Heat is a form of kinetic energy. It's the most random kinetic energy, and then also light. Light is a form of kinetic energy, all right? So we have Lots of examples here. This is not a living thing, however, uh, these three are. So all living things can convert energy from one form to another. <clears throat> what is the ultimate source of energy for all living things on the surface of the earth? Any guesses? If you said the sun, this is correct. So the sun supplies all of the earth with a constant renewal of kinetic energy, okay? And so all the living things on the planet can convert um, one energy form to another, but what kind of organisms can actually put this energy into organic molecules? What kind of organisms can use the sun, right? That renewable source from the sun and convert it to another kind of energy? Well, those are all the photosynthetic organisms out there. So if you said plants, you're correct. But outside of plants, there's also a little photosynthetic algae, there's photosynthetic bacteria, so there's other things that can photosynthesize. But yeah, so it's up to those photosynthetic organisms on the surface of our Earth to take the renewable form of energy, this light energy, and put it into potential energy. And then all other forms of life are going to depend on those photosynthesizing um, organisms, right? Because all the other kinds of the potential energy that's on the planet, the plants themselves, right, those organic molecules, they are formed because of, or they're present because of those plants. So plants are really, really important. If 
all the plants and all the photosynthesizing organisms died, then everything else would die because everything else that depends on eating plants or, you know, yeah, basically eating plants, animals, and other animals that depend on eating other animals, ultimately they all depend on plants. So all of life would cease to exist if we didn't have photosynthesis. Kind of a, a weird thought to think of, right? But that's true. Okay, here's another example of um, chemical energy. So um, real quick, the potential energy in chemical bonds molecules, right? So now we're talking about gas. When we break the bonds of an organic molecule like octane here, that's in our gas, it does release the energy and that release energy can be used by different things for different processes. So for living things, that would be to do chemical reactions, to build molecules so we can grow. But let's just take a look at the car, right? So a car, 25% of the energy in gas is converted to the car moving. 75% of that energy in gas is lost as heat. So we're starting off with octane and oxygen. So this combustion is uh, the chemical uh, reaction that breaks down octane and you can release the heat, or sorry, release the energy that's in the bonds of octane with combustion. The engine of the car is made so when this energy is released, it can harness that energy to move the car, right? But it turns out that we're moving the car, but with only 25% of the energy, just because the engine of the car is not very efficient, it just can't convert all that energy into moving the car. And so we're the heat, you're obviously, you know, that the engine heats up, right? When you've been running your car. So a lot of the energy that's in this gas molecule or octane will be lost as heat. Okay. And the products of combustion are carbon dioxide and water. Now look what happens in your cell. Your cells do the same thing. It's a kind of combustion, but it's different, right? Obviously we're not exploding or um, <laughs> gas inside of our bodies, but our form, our organic molecule is glucose, whereas the car's organic molecule is octane. It's the same um, chemical reaction, but slower. Um, and the combustion that's going on inside your cells is called cellular respiration. We're breaking down the glucose molecule we're harnessing the energy from those chemical bonds, the potential energy, and your cell will use that energy to do cellular work. The energy is also lost, right? We do lose a lot of heat energy, and this is why our bodies are warm. You have a, a constant body temperature because anytime you do chemical reactions, you're losing some heat, and you're getting the same products, carbon dioxide and water, that you exhale, okay? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the cell is actually more efficient than the car. So 34% versus 25%, right? 34% of the energy in food is converted to work. We're losing 66% as body heat, but that's better than a car. A car loses 75% of the heat. So it's kind of depressing when you think about filling your car up and you think that you're paying whatever you're paying, 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars to fill up your tank and only 25% of your money is going to moving the car. The other 75% of your money is actually going to just heating up your car and heating up the planet, <laughs> basically, right? All right, how do we measure um, potential energy in chemicals? We use calories. So letter C, when we measure energy, the potential energy we consume every day is measured in calories. The food we eat contains potential energy. Um, and remember that the word calorie, the capital C calorie is what you see on food labels. And this is actually a kilocalorie. So if you look down here, right, the capital C calorie is actually a kilocalorie. Um, so the, the kilocalorie, the actual measuring is the little c calorie. Okay, so big C just implies that it's a kilocalorie. So it's a thousand calories. Anyhow, so here's just different examples of calories that's in food. If you look at the activities that you, when you burn calories, right, for about a 150 pound person, um, if you run a seven minute mile, this is very fast. This is very fast. I've been running and I'm nowhere near seven minute miles. Um, if you run seven minutes per mile, you will burn 700, I'm sorry, 979 calories, right? Um, if you do what I do most of the time, which is sitting, <laughs> I'm burning 28 calories an hour. So um, if you want to look at just um, how many you know, hours does it take 
maybe to burn off the calories of an apple. You have 81 calories in the apple. Uh, you have to sit around for four hours to burn that apple off. All right. So anyway, it's just some interesting um, numbers, but just remember that calories is the way that we, we measure energy, potential energy in foods. Okay. So other things about energy, just real quick before we move on to metabolism, is that we can convert energy for human use. So we, you know, when we are on the planet and we're using different ener you know, energy sources, um, a lot of our energy, you know, now this is, this is changing, but we basically rely on burning fossil fuels. So what's the energy in fossil fuels? It's potential energy in the oils, right? In that, the organic molecules that is oil. We burn that in combustion, just like the car example. And the um, downside of this is that it's not sustainable because we're going to run out of fossil fuels and it's also very polluting. So there are other forms of energy conversion methods out there that are gaining a lot of popularity. Um, biofuels, so fuels made by plants, the oils. So there's nothing different, right? There's oils in plants and there's oils from decaying organisms from a very long time ago, our fossil fuels. Both of these things are organic molecules. So we can use the potential energy in these organic molecules in different ways. So we're, we're growing biofuels, so the oils that these plants make as biofuels. Uh, we can use water turbines, right? So for, um, and wind turbines, this is basically the kinetic energy that's in the wind. We can harness that kinetic energy and put it into a battery, a form of potential energy. Nuclear power plants are harnessing the energy inside the nucleus. Solar panels are harnessing the potential, sorry, the kinetic energy in light and putting it into a potential energy in battery. Geothermal energy is another form of energy um, that we're using, a, a more of a renewable form of energy. All right, so that concludes the energy portion. Um, now we're going to move on to metabolism. Okay, so we're going to start, start talking about living things and how living things use energy and convert energy. The word metabolism is defined as all the chemical reactions that occur inside the cell. Some of them need energy and some of them release energy. And so the cell will, the, the cell is very efficient. So if a chemical reaction happens and it releases energy, and then you have another chemical reaction that occurs, but it requires energy to happen, then the cell will take the energy away from the chemical reaction that released it and then use that energy to power the chemical reaction that requires it. So this is called coupling reactions. And there's a, a molecule that does this, which is ATP, very important molecule. Um, it, the full name of the molecule is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And what it is, is it's an adenosine molecule. This is uh, the same kind of molecule that's going to be the base in nucleotide A. Um, but <clears throat> It's adenosine, and then you have three phosphates, right? Triphosphate means three phosphate groups. These phosphate groups are um, very big um, charged phosphates. Each of these has a negative charge. And what do you guys know about the same charge, right? If you have three negative charges together, the same charges repel, right? Opposite charges attract. Uh, the same charges are going to repel each other. So these guys are held together tightly by these chemical bonds. So the chemical bond here and the chemical bond here. The phosphate groups don't actually want to be together, right? They actually want, they're re repulsive. And so they want to actually come away. So if you're forcing two things together, it takes energy to keep them together. So this bond here is actually really, really high energy. So you have these two bonds here that are very high energy. And when uh, you, re you cut one of these phosphates off, right, so you cleave that phosphate, um, you are releasing a bunch of energy. And this is how ATP works. So ATP has um, a stored energy within the bonds between these phosphate groups here and here. And then when you cut the last phosphate group off, um, then you release that energy that's in that bond. So how does the cell use that energy? Just one more look at, way to look at this, right? So ATP, this is kind of like a charged battery. And then you release the energy 
by cleaving off that last phosphate group. So I just want to make sure this little I here is, it stands for inorganic phosphate. So it, it's not scary. Uh, so it just means that when you take the phosphate off an organic molecule, it becomes inorganic. And then this is kind of like a dead battery because the most energy of ATP really is, for the most part, just uses that last, last phosphate group. So when you cut that phosphate group off, you kind of have a dead, dead battery. You need to recharge the battery. And how do you do that? You need to just put that phosphate group back on. So this requires energy, okay? And when you put that energy into the ATP to put that phosphate group back on, you recharged the ATP molecule. Okay, so this is a cycle that happens inside your body all the time. So anytime ATP is used, ATP will become ADP. What does the D stand for? It's diphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, because we only have two phosphates left. But when you lose that third phosphate, it's kind of like a dead battery, and then you recharge it, right? So this is the little um, cycle of ATP that goes on inside your cells. So what does ATP actually do when you cut that phosphate off? So this is what it actually does. So um, I want to take a look before I move on any further at your outline. So you know, so under number two metabolism, I have coupled reactions. Energy released from one reaction is used to power another reaction, and we're using ATP. The structure of ATP, I have what it stands for. It's a nucleotide with ne three negatively charged phosphate groups attached. Negative charges repel each other. Three together contribute to the potential energy of ATP. All right, so now we have number two, the function of ATP. Letter A is the word phosphorylation. Okay, so you wanna know this word phosphorylation. ATP here, right, it's all spiky and shiny because it has a lot of energy. When you break that phosphate group off, group off, what happens? So the phosphate group here in yellow actually attaches to the reactants of a chemical reaction. So the, the, when there's a chemical reaction that's going to proceed, right, the reactants are the molecules that are around before the chemical reaction. Maybe they make a bond. In this case, they, they this orange square and this base square, they want to hook up together, but they don't like to do that ordinarily. You need to put energy into it. So this phosphate group comes along and it attaches to one of the reactants. You can think of this as like a little zap, um, a little charge of electricity, and it makes this very unstable and more likely to react. It doesn't like the phosphate group on there. It makes it kind of jittery. You can think of it like that. And so this phosphate group, now this orange X is called phosphorylated. This reactant is now phosphorylated. And because it's phosphorylated, it makes them unstable and more likely to react. So then to kick off this phosphate group, it's better that this other square comes in and reacts with it. So when it comes together to make that chemical bond, it can kick away that phosphate group, okay? So that's how ATP works. ATP take you break that phosphate group off of the atp molecule the phosphate group attaches to a reactant the reactant becomes unstable it doesn't like that phosphate group and it's going to react with something to make that phosphate group go away the chemical reaction occurs the phosphate group is kicked off and so now atp has done its job because all atp wanted to do is to get these two squares together the two squares are together and now we don't need this phosphate group anymore, okay? Here's another example. ATP is used for many processes that require energy. This example shows ATP used to power a transport protein to pump a solute molecule across the membrane. So let's take a look. So this is a channel protein and it has this um, tube, right, for this solute molecule to go from one side of the membrane to the other side. But this kind of transport is called active transport. So we haven't gotten there yet um, in lecture, but if you're going to help push a molecule from a lower concentration towards a higher concentration, this actually takes energy. It's like pushing a boulder uphill. And the phosphate group will allow, the ATP will donate a phosphate group to this channel protein. The channel protein will push the solute molecule to the other side of the membrane, right? as you see here, and when it does that, it can let go of the phosphate group. 
and then you have an ADP and your inorganic phosphate. So the, the protein here needs a little charge in order to pump a little solute across the membrane. Okay, so ATP is used just to power anything that needs to happen inside the cell. So it's called the energy currency of the cell. ATP is renewable. So letter B in your outline, ATP cycle, you can renew ATP. So you don't need to create a brand new ATP molecule every time you use it. You just recycle it. We looked at this, right? You recharge the battery. So ATP, you lose that phosphate group, and this is for work. So like the, the adding the two squares together or pumping that solute molecule across the membrane, that's what happened. Now you're left with this. Well, how do you get these two back on? This is from that whole cellular respiration process. So this is the entire chapter six is going to talk about cellular respiration. This is the food you eat, right? So from fuel molecules. So when you eat a sandwich, the starch, the sugars, the, the proteins, all of that, that's the energy that comes in and you use that energy to create or recharge your ATP molecule. So it, this energy puts this phosphate group back on. It's really complicated, so we'll, we'll wait for chapter six to do that, but that's what happens. All right, here's your concept check. So pause to think about and get your answer. All right, so in order to transform the blank of ATP, so what's the energy in ATP? It's potential energy into kinetic energy to do work. So we're here, potential energy to kinetic energy. All right. All right. So our next topic here is going to be enzymes. So before we move on to enzymes, you have a chemical reaction little reminder. Reactants um, are on one side of the chemical reaction and products are on the other side of the arrow. Okay. Um, and anytime you have a chemical reaction occurring, there is something called activation energy that it needs to put into the chemical reaction. So um, let's look at enzymes. Enzymes, so chemical reactions in a cell need to proceed very quickly. If we left the chemicals to react on their own, even, if with, with, even with ATP present, even if you had a bunch of ATP, if you just let the chemicals kind of float around and eventually react, because they're, they slammed together at the, you know, at, at the perfect speed. It's not fast enough for life. Life needs chemical reactions to happen immediately, right? So if, so if there's a change in the cell, if there's a change in the environment, you can react to that stimulus immediately. So you need chemical reactions to happen immediately and very quickly. If we left the chemicals on their own to react, we'd be waiting for too long, okay? So enzymes are biological catalysts. The word catalyst is something that chemists use to make a reaction proceed faster. But in the cell, we use uh, this organic molecule as a catalyst that helps reactions proceed faster so that when the cell needs a reaction to occur, it does. Cells create thousands of different enzymes, each catalyzing one specific reaction. So this is a, a little dancing enzyme. Enzymes are usually drawn as kind of a blob and they have very special areas on their, um, on their molecule that help the reaction proceed. So let's start taking a look at what an enzyme is. All right, so in order to understand um, a chemical reaction, um, we have to talk about activation energy. So, here, let's just start with this example of, this is what you start off with. So there is a boulder, and eventually we want this boulder to break up into chunks, okay? We want to break the boulder apart. Without an enzyme, there is this energy hump that needs to be um, overcome in order for the, the um, reactant to become the product. But with an enzyme, this this energy hump gets pushed down so there's not that much more energy that you need and you get the same result okay so activation activation energy is the energy required it's the required input of energy to make a reaction start 
Let's look at it another way. Here's the reactants of a chemical reaction. So this is what you start off with. Here are the products. We want to break that chemical bond. It turns out that you don't, you can't just go from reactants to products, that there is an energy barrier that stops everything from breaking down. So if this reactant just spontaneously broke down to products, um, then every molecule out there might spontaneously break down. But we know that molecules are very stable. For example, sugar, right? Table sugar, sucrose, and flour. You can have those in your cupboard forever and they never break down chemically. They don't spontaneously break down. Why? Because in order to break this bond, you have to put energy into breaking that bond. This is the amount of energy that you need in order to destabilize this bond enough for that bond to break. So hopefully that makes sense. Activation energy. You need to put this much energy in in order to break this bond. With an enzyme, however, enzymes are catalysts. They reduce the energy barrier. So the activation energy is greatly reduced so that the chemical bond, the bond here can be destabilized with just a little bit of energy. You don't need all this energy anymore because we have an enzyme here. The enzyme can actually um, have the reaction proceed with less activation energy. Okay, so overall, you just need to understand that what enzymes do inside a cell is that they um, decrease the amount of activation energy required for a chemical reaction to happen. Okay, so look at this graph. We have the reactants of a chemical reaction, we have the products of the chemical reaction, and then we have two lines here. We have a line with the black and then align with the red. Both start at reactants, both end at the products. These are the, this is the energy, right? This is one energy hump, this is another energy hump. Which of the following is the normal energy of activation and which of the following represents the energy of activation in the presence of an enzyme? Okay, so activation energy. What letter? A, the difference between here and here. B, the difference between here and here. Or C, the difference between here and here. How much energy is the normal energy of activation? Well, it's going to be letter A. It's going to be from the reactants. How high, how much energy do I need to put into that chemical reaction for the products to, to be formed, right? So A. But if I add an enzyme, number three, if I add an enzyme, what's the new energy activation with an enzyme? And that's going to be B. We're still starting at the energy of the reactants. We just have to put a little bit of energy in and we get the same energy in the products, okay? So all enzymes do is they decrease the activation energy. Why do cells use enzymes? Again, to speed up chemical reactions. So this is an example. You don't need to memorize this at all. But ethanol, which is your alcohol in beer and wine, is metabolized into another molecule called acetaldehyde by an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. If you don't have that enzyme, the reaction rate is this, okay? We don't need to go into a whole lot of detail. But with an enzyme, the reaction rate is 2,700. So we went from a very small amount of reactions per minute to 2,700 reactions per minute. So that's an acceleration of more than 4,500 million times faster. This chemical reaction happens 4,500 million times faster with an enzyme than without an enzyme. So this is why enzymes are so critical because we need, the cell needs chemical reactions to happen very fast, quickly, immediately. So this is the difference that an enzyme can make. All right, so how do enzymes work? <clears throat> so if we look at structure letter A in your outline, enzymes are made of protein, okay? So this purple guy, this is an enzyme. The chemical reactions, remember, there's reactants and then um, products, but the reactants are going to be called substrates when you talk about enzymes, okay? So now let's look at here. There's an, an area on the enzyme called the active site. This is where the substrate will bind. Now, I'm going to step ahead, go ahead a little bit and just say that enzymes are named after their substrate. 
So this enzyme is going to break down sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide. We can break it down into monosaccharides. And enzymes are often named after their substrate. So if we're breaking down sucrose, this enzyme is called sucrase. Enzymes will end in ASE. That's how you name enzymes. ASE is the ending. So sucrase helps break down sucrose. Okay. The active site is where sucrose is going to fit and it's empty right now. So it's ready for the substrate. Here's sucrose. Okay. So sucrose is going to bind to the active site. <clears throat> when the sucrose is in the active site, the chemical reaction can occur. So where catalysis is breaking things down. So we broke the bond between our two monosaccharides and we're releasing the products. Okay, the product is what you call the end um, products. And we release those guys and the enzyme is ready to go again. So the enzyme, nothing happened to the enzyme. The enzyme is a renewable. It's not changed or altered. Um, it's just ready to create <clears throat> or um, catalyze another chemical reaction. Okay, so you have that picture in the, um, in the notes. All right, so enzymes can be controlled. Um, enzymes, if they're present in the cell, they're going to function with um, and, and sort of run the chemical reaction very quickly. However, you don't want all the chemical reactions to happen all the time um, because you need to switch up what the cell is doing, right? The cell is not doing one thing all the time. <clears throat> so. What we're going to do is we're going to um, look at how you can control an enzyme at this point. This is called um, enzyme uh, inhibition. So if you look at letter C in your outline or regulation of enzymes, <clears throat> enzymes can be slowed down or stopped from working if the cell does not want a chemical reaction to occur. And this happens in two ways. The first way is called competitive inhibition. A molecule which is not the substrate binds to the active site of an enzyme. So let me just go back and mention again, I think I, I sort of mentioned this, but I didn't. Enzymes are um, <clears throat> substrate specific. So one enzyme only works on one chemical reaction. So this enzyme sucrase only binds to sucrose. It only does this one chemical reaction. It actually can do it in reverse as well, but it just does, um, it just breaks down sucrose. This enzyme doesn't do anything else. It just works on sucrose, all right? So they're substrate specific. That's why you have so many enzymes inside your body or inside of a cell because you have all different kinds of chemical reactions that are happening. <clears throat> and they're necessary for these chemical reactions to happen, right? If you don't, if you're, the enzyme is not working, then the chemical reaction does not go. So if you wanted to control, slow down, um, and stop an enzyme from working in a normal manner, the cell will actually make something called inhibitors that slow down and stop the, the enzyme from working. So the first kind of inhibitor is competitive inhibition. So again, this is the active site. This is where the substrate will bind, right? So this is, looks pretty normal. This is an imposter. So this red molecule is made by the cell. This is a normal molecule, but if the cell was like, hmm, I don't, we don't need this one certain chemical reaction to happen anymore. Let's slow it down or stop it for a while. The cell will make an inhibitor that looks a little bit like the substrate. It fits in the active site, so it fits in that little area, and it blocks the actual substrate from binding. So it stopped the chemical reaction from happening because we have an inhibitor that's taking up the spot, um, taking up the active site, right? So the, the substrate can't bind. So that's just basically called competitive inhibition because the, the inhibitor is competing with the substrate for the active site. I have a spot for you to, to draw this out. So if you wanted to draw this out, that would be what you would draw there. And then there's another <clears throat> number two, a non competitive uh, regulation or non-competitive uh, inhibitor, which is where a molecule binds to the allosteric site of an enzyme. Okay, uh, let's go back to that. So an allosteric site is here. So notice that there is that little chunk missing down here. This is another site. It's not the active site, right? But it's a, a place where another form of an inhibitor can bind. 
So this is called the allosteric site. When this inhibitor fits in here, when this fits, the active site changes. So this is a very big active site. It's ready for the substrate. When the inhibitor attaches to the enzyme, the active site changed shape. It shrunk. And so it, it didn't allow the substrate to bind, and we stopped the reaction. It's a different way because we're not competing with the substrate anymore. We're not binding to the active site. We're binding to another area, okay, called the allosteric site. And so I have draw a non-competitive inhibitor, and you could draw this out. And read this concept check. All right, so if you read it, the answer is letter B. The shape of the enzyme's active site generally fits a specific substrate, so the enzyme only works on one specific kind of chemical reaction. All right, so you should be um, well first in this graph, so take a look. What is the normal energy of activation? So you should have picked letter B. And here is, uh, I'm jumping down the letter, well, let's talk about D first. Enzymes, remember enzymes are um, proteins, and proteins can denature. So enzymes are, a, are um, you can denature enzymes. So again, the three um, big um, external factors, pH, a high temperature, heat, and salt, those are all things that can denature proteins, and so they can also denature enzymes. And so if you denature an enzyme, the enzyme does not work anymore, okay? So I want to look at letter E, what scientists can do with enzymes. Enzymes are used a lot in the products that we buy. Um, if you just take a look at this, we have some, some consumer products. Um, there are enzymes that are found in different supplements. So uh, Beano, for example, is an enzyme that will break down the complex carbohydrates within beans that can cause some people to have gas. So it's kind of like breaking them down before um, the bacteria gets them in your gut so the bacteria can't eat them, so it, it doesn't make the gas. Um, so all these different things are enzymes that you can take in to help you break down molecules. Um, if you look at this, this is laundry detergent. Laundry detergent will have enzymes in there to break down chemically things like oils that are on your clothing. So take a look here. Um, protease, A-S-E, there is an enzyme. Amylase, A-S-E, there is an enzyme. Protease breaks down proteins. Amylase breaks down um, starches. So there's a couple of enzymes there to help you break things um, like maybe food products or any organic products that might be on your, your shirt. This is from Alba. This is a, a, a facial mask. If you look at the ingredients here, there are enzymes. So we have, um, where does it say? Uh, now I lost the, the word. Oh, here, protease, right? There's our, our enzyme. This mask is an exfoliation mask. So basically when you exfoliate your skin, you want to take off that very, very first like dead layer of skin. Um, and this helps you break down the proteins in your skin. So it has a protease um, in this mask. That's not unusual. There's lots and lots of masks with proteases in there. So don't be scared. They're, they can be gentle. This is Meyer's product, right? This is also using enzyme stain fighting enzymes. Enzymes are also used in medicine and also for killing. So if you think about it, um, if you can block or stop a living thing from using its enzymes, um, you can kill that cell or kill that living thing because if you block a very important chemical reaction, you can um, kill it. So that's the idea behind a lot of antibiotics. Drugs, you can make a drug that looks like the enzyme's um, substrate. So it basically looks like a competitive inhibitor and you can add that to um, your person, you know, a cell and the cell will die. So if you stop the enzyme, and there's all different kinds of um, products here. So this, this is just some enzymes that are inhibited, and these are some uses for it. Um, obviously, nerve gas is something that it kills people, um, and cyanide can kill people because it stops an enzyme um, that's very important for using um, oxygen and um, making ATP for the body. So um, Along with these, there's also pesticides and herbicides and um, different killing products out there will actually use um, 
target enzymes as a way to kill the living thing. So here is a, uh, before we, we stop this section of the video, a nice thing, or not nice thing to think about, but it's something to think about. Many insecticides operate as permanent enzyme inhibitors. Organophosphate insecticides interfere with nerve transmission, affecting not only insects, but also humans and other vertebrates. Okay, so if you put this organophosphate insecticide out into your garden, it will bind permanently to enzymes that are important for the, the bug to survive. So it kills the bug. However, if you took a lot of this um, insecticide, if you accidentally drank the insecticide, it would do the same thing to you. It's doing this, the exact same, it's the same chemical reaction that we have in our cells as well as the insects have. The reason why it doesn't kill us is because it's in such small amounts um, it kills the insect with just a tiny bit of it, but for us, you would have to use a lot more. Um, and so they, they basically say like a tiny bit of this insecticide is harmless to us. It won't kill you, right? But it will kill the bug. However, do you want that in your body, right? So um, use of these insecticides is regulated and requires caution. And that's the whole argument for organic products out there, or not the whole argument, but it's one of the arguments for organic products in buying organic or, or only farming organically is because organic farming does not use these insecticides. It doesn't use these chemicals, organophosphates, to kill off pests. It doesn't use nasty chemicals that kill off weeds. So um, the downside, I guess, is that organic vegetables are more expensive. Um, and so this is just something to think about, right? I'm willing to pay a little more for slightly blemished, but otherwise healthy food products, especially if insecticides were not used. Um, so that's just a, something to think about. And we'll pause, we'll do part two in another video.